to the book of 1 Timothy, we have uh, been looking at what, what many have called Paul's blueprint for the church. And, and it's not so much a, a guideline or a plan or a, a uh, system of structure for the church, but really it is guidelines or instructions into how to live a Christian life within the context of the relationships within the body of Christ. And this morning, we want to take a look at what I have called the current Christian challenge. This was a challenge that was due to the Ephesian believers. It was something that they were having to face up to, and Timothy as well. But I would argue that the challenge that they faced is the same challenge we face day by day, calling ourselves Christians. Christians means that we bear the name of Christ. And in bearing the name of Christ, there are certain challenges to us that we must rise to the occasion and follow if we are truly going to be Christian. So this morning I want to take a look at that challenge. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 18, Paul reminds Timothy about the command that he had received that he is now passing on. And in, th- in these three verses, he recaptures th- what he is wanting to do in the entire letter. So to Timothy, he says, listen to this. This is the crux of the matter. This is the, the heart of the issue. Or in other terms, and I'm sure Paul wouldn't have said this, because this is a modern phrase. This is where the rubber hits the road. You know, they didn't have rubber, and they had very few roads. So they, Paul probably wouldn't have said that. But for those of us, this is where, where the issue really comes into contact with our lives. How do we live our lives as followers of Christ Jesus? Follow along with me, if you would, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. And listen to what Paul says to Timothy. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made a shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's pray together. Father, as we look at the examples of Timothy and even the examples of Hymenaeus and Alexander, Father, remind us what you have called us to. Remind us what the challenge is. And Father, I pray that through the power of your Spirit, you would enable us to rise to the challenge. Father, as we look at your Scripture, we pray that your Spirit would add your blessing to the reading of your Word, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Paul has kind of been a good Baptist preacher in that he has chased a couple of rabbits in verses 8 through 17, and now he comes back to this issue at hand, and he says to Timothy, you need to remember some things. You need to recognize the Christian mandate that you have been called under. And beginning in in the latter part of verse 18 through verse 19, he lays out what the mandate of the Christian is and really what Timothy's own mandate is. Now before we get too far along, we have to look at the issue or the word mandate. Here's what mandate means according to Webster's Dictionary. First of all, it is a commander from a superior a command from a superior court or a superior official to a lower of court or to a lower official. Much like our court of appeals and our Supreme Court processes, when when the word comes from the Supreme Court down to all of the other courts, it is a command that all the other courts are bound to follow. Or And this is one of those things that that I'm unfamiliar with because I never served in the military and I am amazed at the men and women who do. They know what a chain of command is. That when they receive commands from a superior officer, they are bound by duty and by law to obey the commands that they were giving. That's what a mandate is. It is also an authoritative order. It is something that is communicated with authority and power and has the force of law. So a mandate is something that is issued that the recipient of the mandate 
must obey or must uh, heed and do. Now, the mandate for Timothy is spelled out in this passage. It is Paul's command to Timothy in response to what God is doing in his life. He says to Timothy, Timothy, I'm commanding you. I'm giving you this command. And really, it is the same word in verse 18 that's used back in verse 3, where Paul says, I have been commanded by God. And now he says, I've been commanded by God. Now I'm commanding you. So I'm, I'm passing the authority or I'm passing the command down the chain. This is what was commanded of me. This is what is commanded of you. Because of what God is doing in my life and what God is doing in your life, this is what we must do. And you know what? The mandate hasn't changed a whole lot from the time of Timothy to the time of us. Because the mandate is really Christ's command to us based on what God is doing in each of our lives. Now let me just pause and camp here for just a moment. I believe God's at work in your life. You may not always see it. You may not always recognize the hand of God or the work of God or the voice of God, but I'm here to tell you, God is at work in every person's life to accomplish His will and His way. Because God is at work, He wants you to join Him in His work. And the way that you join Him in doing what He wants to do in your life is by following the commands that He gives, by following the mandate that He has issued in our lives. For Timothy, Paul spells it out in three ways in this text, and it's the same three things that are our mandate as well. Listen to what he says. The Christian mandate, beginning in verse 18, is we are to wage the good warfare. Now, Paul likes military analogies. In many of his scriptures, he describes the Christian life almost in terms of a battlefield. That we are waging a spiritual war. Now, what Paul says to Timothy is we are engaged on the spiritual battleground where, where God and the adversary are at war and we are his foot soldiers. We are the ones who are out in the field doing battle with the enemy. And what he says to, to Timothy is you must be a faithful, good, war-hardened veteran in going out to face the battle. How many wars would America have won if we had sent our soldiers into the foxholes and the minute hostilities arose, they threw down their guns and ran? We wouldn't win very many, would we? That would not be the mark of a good soldier. Now, can I ju I'm just going to I'm just going to chase a rabbit. Okay, I told you Baptist preachers chase rabbits. I'm going to chase a rabbit. Donald Trump is nuts when he says that a prisoner of war who fought in behind the lines and fought the enemy and taken and, and, and put into prison for years, he's nuts when he says they're not heroes. My friends, I have a lot of problems with John McCain, but he's still a hero because when he fought, he didn't throw down his weapons and run. He fought to the point of capture and, and suffering in a prison. And when Donald Trump says he's not a hero, I think he is messed up and wrong. We have to understand what the qualities of a good soldier is. And the qualities of a good soldier is not winning the battle, but standing up for the fight and not running. That's what Paul is telling Timothy. The mandate for him is he must face the conflict ahead and face it without fear, without running, without intimidation, without uh, running the risk of just surrendering to the enemy. He must wage war and he must wage a good warfare. The same is true for us. We are engaged in spiritual warfare, whether you realize it or not. Every day you awake, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are going to experience the onslaught of the adversary to tempt you away from obeying God, being obedient to God, and, and away, distracted from the Word of God. The adversary is on the attack, and he's going to do what he can, when he can, to get you off the battlefield. Paul says to Timothy, stay in the fight. 
Stay in and wage the good warfare. And what I say to you is our mandate is just the same. We have received our marching orders from the Lord Jesus Christ, and we must stay engaged in the battle and faithful to the cause. Now, how do we do that? We do that by, by following the other two elements of the mandate that are included here. Paul says to Timothy, wage the good warfare, wage a good fight. But then he goes on to say, you must hold the faith. What does it mean to hold to the faith? Now, this is one of those things that scholars will debate. And, and it's one of those things that we have very vague notions about. When we talk about faith, most of the time in churches today, we're talking about a very personalized experience that we've had with God. That's not what Paul is talking about. He'll talk about that in a few moments, but he's not talking about the individual warm feelings that we had when we came to experience an encounter with Jesus Christ. What he's talking about is he's talking about a body of beliefs that shape our thinking and shape our feelings so that we we align ourselves with the will of God. Hold the faith. In other words, abandon the ways and the wisdoms of the world and embrace the ways and the wisdom of Christ. The faith, that which has been handed down by the apostles and the prophets and the Word of God, that's what we are to hold on to. And that word, hang on to, means to cling. It means to embrace it and wrap it so tightly that it cannot be grasped or taken from you. Folks, I'm here to tell you there's a lot of things in our world today that is going to want to distract you and take you away from a commitment to the Word of God. I'm going to venture to guess, this wasn't in my notes, but I'm just going to venture to guess, that every single one of you have something in your home, probably in your living room, maybe with all your chairs pointed towards it. It has a little thing that you hold in your hand that you can control and make you feel like God. Because you can press a power button and it pops on. And you press another button and the channels change. You all know what I'm talking about? How many of you all have a television somewhere in your house? If you're like me, you probably have multiple televisions in your house. I hate to admit, but there was a time in our married life, our daughter had, grown, or had gone to college, and there was only two of us in the home, and we had five televisions in our house, and there were only two of us living in the house. We just had a television in almost every room we had. Now, I'm just here to tell you, that's a little messed up. You know why? Because that is often the distraction from hanging on to what we need to hang on to. It may be for you, it may not be for you. If it's not the television, I'll guarantee you there's something else in your life that distracts you from holding on to the faith that has been passed down generation after generation from church to church. What Paul says to Timothy is get rid of the distractions and hang on. Hang on for dear life to the faith that has been given to you. Hold it near and dear to your heart make it sanctified and set apart in your mind think on it feel on it reflect on it allow it to be a part of who you are and do not do not let go of the faith not the warm fuzzy feelings because those feelings always kind of ebb and flow but he says hang on to the truth of what has been given to us now notice the next thing he says not only are we to guard and protect and hang on to that which we believe and feel in Christ Jesus, but we are called to hold a good conscience. Okay, we talked a little bit about conscience in our Sunday school class this morning. A good conscience is one where our hearts are not pointing its bony finger at us and saying, you messed up. You know what I mean? Anybody ever suffer from guilt? If you're a Baptist for any length of time, you've suffered from guilt. Okay? Let's face it. We are a guilt, shame-based society. And some of us like to wallow in our guilt, our shame. I really blew it. And we just kind of flog ourselves. Notice what Paul says. 
we must, or Timothy must, live his life in such a way that his conscience does not accuse him of disobedience or failing to obey or failing to follow or failing to fight the fight. Do you hear it? In other words, it's not enough for us to believe the right things in our mind and in our heart. We must live the right things in our actual day-to-day life. What Paul says to Timothy is part of your mandate is not only to embrace the right thing, hold the faith, but your mandate is to live the faith. I I am working on a a paper right now that I'm going to present to our faculty at the college. And it talks about social responsibility. That's That's the topic they've given us to write on. And so I've been thinking a lot this week about what is our social responsibility? You know what our social responsibility is? It's not to influence and change the morals of our culture or past legislation in in our legislature. It's not to to march and mobilize and get non-Christians to act like Christians. You know what our mandate is? Our mandate is, is to believe the right things and live the right way. And let the world see that faith, that testimony, and respond to it. That's what Paul is telling to Timothy. He says, you are under three mandates. First, to fight the good fight, which, by the way, Paul says he does at the end of 2 Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have run the good race. I have held on to the faith. Paul says, listen, this is what you're to do. You're to fight the good fight. You are to hang on to the faith. And you are to live correctly so that your conscience does not condemn you. Now, folks, I'm here to tell you our world would be a lot different if Christians did those three things. If we fought the good fight, if we held on to the faith, and we lived rightly. It would change our world. It would change the culture in which we live. It would change the communities in which we reside. It would change everything if we had Christians who were living the mandate. And the challenge I want to give to you is that as believers, we need to recognize this is our mandate. It's not for somebody else. It's not just for the preachers and the teachers of our churches. It is for every one of us to fight the good fight, hold the faith, and hold a good conscience. Now notice what else Paul says in this passage. We need to receive that mandate and make it our own. You see, it's not enough just to say Christians need to live this way. We need to stand up and say, I am going to live this way. Paul says, this is your mandate, and here's why it is your mandate. Take a look at what he says at the beginning of verse 18. This charge, this mandate, I give to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you. There's a couple of things that Paul says about Timothy to Timothy that reminds him he has received this mandate personally and he's made it his own. First of all, notice his personal charge. This is because of his relationship with Paul. Paul comes along and says, I'm coming to you as a father to son, he says in the scripture. As someone who has been intimately involved in your life, this is what I want you to do. Notice the next thing he says. You are my son. That means he had a personal faith in the Jesus that Paul served. Timothy was, may have or may not have been, depending on who you read, a, a convert of Paul's ministry, a direct convert of Paul's ministry. One of the things that we do know from reading the book of Acts is that Timothy came under the sphere of Paul's influence early on in his Christian life, and they developed a unique and special bond. And it indicates that Timothy not only had a unique bond with Paul, but he had a unique bond with Jesus Christ, that he had a genuine salvation encounter with Jesus. Now, folks, let me tell you, this is very important for me. Mandates come with relationships. In other words, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you're trying to fulfill the mandate, you've got the cart before the horse. If you're trying to obey Jesus before you know Jesus, you've got it wrong. You can work all your heart. You can work everything. I mean, you can do everything you can and still not measure up because it's not really about what you do. It's about whose you are. 
Timothy belonged to Jesus. And it's because of that connection, it was because of that relationship with Jesus that put Timothy under mandate from him. Now notice this last thing. It says that I want to remind you of the prophecies that were made about you when you received the faith. There were prophetic promises connected with Timothy so that when he got saved, or when he felt, quote-unquote, a call to ministry, the congregation sensed, hey, there's something special about this guy. And there were some in the midst that would say, hey, God's going to use you greatly, or God's going to use you to do this. And there were some that affirmed the work of God in Timothy's life. God gave promises to Timothy because of his experience. Now, these, this is the foundation, the relationship with Paul, his relationship with Jesus, and, and his calling that God gave him promises or prophecies at the moment of calling that Paul said, listen, Timothy, these three things have happened in your life. It makes you under mandate to Christ. But I want you to know all three of those things are true for us as well. Christ comes to us and gives us a personal charge and says... I'm going to save you, but now I want you to follow me. Isn't that what Jesus did with each of his disciples? He was walking along the shore of Galilee one day. He saw a bunch of guys out there mending and tending their nets. And he looks at them and he says, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And Peter said, Maybe we will, maybe we won't. I don't know. Let's see how all this Jesus thing works out. Is that what Peter did? Okay, David, you're a lot, when, I, when I say something blatantly wrong like that, you're, oh, there, there you go. No, that wasn't what Peter did. Jesus said, follow me, and Peter immediately left his nets and began to follow Jesus. The same is true for every one of us. Regardless of where we were at or what we were doing or what had been going on in our lives, Jesus comes to us and says, follow me. He gives us the mandate, and we must follow him notice the second thing that's part of our experience because of our personal encounter with jesus as lord we have to follow him now i was raised in a day and an age where pastors would say you have to accept jesus as savior and lord and you may have accepted jesus as savior at an early age but now you must accept him as lord i've heard that I must confess, there's been times in my life I've preached that. That's just heresy. You know why? You cannot embrace Jesus as Savior without embracing Him as Lord. When you come to a personal decision and embrace the work of Jesus Christ in your life, what that means is that you have repented of your way of life, you have changed direction, you have said that your will is not aligned with God, and now you are aligning yourself with Jesus Christ, and He is becoming your Master and your Lord. Now, do you understand everything about that when you come to Jesus? No. You know that Jesus is real, and you're coming to Him, and you're embracing Him. But what that also entails is that you are following Him as the boss, the master, the Lord. He is the one who is now in charge, and He gets to call the shots or issues the commands or the mandates. Now notice this last thing. There were promises that were given to you as a believer in Jesus Christ the moment you were saved, and because of those promises, you need to live according to the mandate you have been given. You know, one of my favorite promises in the Scripture is this. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that an incredible promise of Jesus? doesn't matter what you do. doesn't matter where you go. It doesn't matter what goes on in your life. It doesn't matter the turmoil you experience in your heart. It doesn't matter the doubt that is present in your mind. No matter what goes on, I will always, always, always be with you. Now folks, when Jesus gives us that kind of promise, when we sign on the dotted line and embrace Him as Savior and, and Lord... Folks, that ought to give us the motivation to always live to our mandate because we know we are never alone, right? When we're in that foxhole and the world is, is shooting at us and we're experiencing the slings and the arrows and the hostility of the world, we are not in that foxhole by ourselves. Jesus is there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. 
That's only one of the thousands of promises that are contained in the Scripture for those who follow God. Now, folks, I'm here to tell you that because we have a personal relationship with Jesus, because Jesus has issued His command to follow Him, and because we've experienced the promises He's given, we need to live to the calling He has placed. Fight the good fight. Hold the faith. Hold a good conscience and live the faith. We're under obligation to do that. As believers, we need to personalize that mandate. You know what I see in a lot of people? Pastor, I like that sermon. I love it when at the end of service, people walk by and they say, Pastor, that was a great sermon. I wish so-and-so was here to hear that. <laughs> you ever hear people say something like that? You know what the problem with that is? You're saying, well, that message might be good, but I don't need it. I'm just fine. They're the ones who have a problem. I have a real problem with that. You know why? Because that's not personalizing the message of God to yourself. When God shows up and gives you a mandate, He is talking to you. He's not talking about your neighbor. He's not talking about your spouse or your kids or your parents or your co-workers. He's not talking about your fellow church members. He's talking to you, and He's saying, you must follow me. In the Civil War, they had a, a, a process where people could buy themselves out of the draft. That if you could pony up $300 and give it to the nation, you didn't have to go serve in, in battle. And many of us approach that the same way in our spiritual lives. Lord, I'm so glad you've died for me and you've saved me and you've rescued me from my sin. You want me to go where? Guess what? I'll give my money to the church. They'll give their money to missionaries and we'll send somebody else in my place. But I'm not going. Anybody see a problem with that? I hope so. Because when Paul says to Timothy, you need to take this as your personal mandate, he wasn't talking about Hymenaeus and Alexander and all the other uh, false teachers taking place in Ephesus. He was talking about Timothy. And today, you are presented with the challenge to personally embrace the mandate that Jesus has for you. Not for your neighbor, not for your friends, not for your family, but for you. Now notice this last thing. We have to recognize that there are some risks if we reject this mandate. You see, there's a certain risking that takes place when we say, Jesus, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. I'm not going to fight the battle. I'm not going to hold on to the faith. I'm going to live the way I want to live. When we say to Jesus, whether it be verbally and mentally, consciously, or whether it be unconsciously, the reality is, is we run a great danger when we say, Jesus, I'm going to do it my way. And the danger is found in verses 19 and 20. Here's the danger. Here's the first one. By rejecting this, look at verse 19, by rejecting this, some of them have made a shipwreck of their faith. Now, this is a pretty amazing statement from someone who had actually been shipwrecked. I've never been shipwrecked. I'm sure glad I never have. But I, every time I watch one of these cruises and all the power gets shut down, or that cruise in, in outside of Italy last year where it ended up on its side. and, and Man, I, I look at that and it terrifies me being in that kind of environment. Paul says that when someone leaves the mandate by rejecting the mandate, they've not lived this way. What they have done is they have spiritually destroyed and devastated their lives. They have put themselves in a spiritually life-threatening situation. And by life-threatening, I'm talking not only their spiritual life, I'm talking about many of them, their physical lives as well. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, or chapter 11, I think it's verse 29 or 30. It talks about the spiritual rebellion of God's people sometimes leads to physical consequences spiritual risking their life now folks i'm here to tell you i want to have a good life how many of y'all want to have a horrible rotten disgusting you know life falling apart nobody wants to sign up for that come on nobody nobody wants that we we want a peaceable happy enjoyable uh, experience in this world 
Let me tell you, the only way believers are going to experience peace and joy in this life is by embracing the mandate that Jesus gives. Rejecting the mandate is going to result in lives that are shattered on the rocks, where our lives, our very lives, are threatened. Now notice that Paul uses two examples in verse 20. He says, by this Hymeus and Alexander. Now we're not sure who these guys are, but they were probably some of the faction of the false teachers in the Ephesian church. But these guys I have handed over to Satan because they have been rebellious. Now, I'm not sure I understand all what this means, but I do understand one thing. I don't want to be there. Right? Right? I mean, I may not understand all the implications that Paul has when he says, I've given them over to Satan, but I'm going to tell you, I don't want to be in Satan's hands. I want to be somewhere else. Don't you? Okay, give me some indication you don't want to go there. I mean, if you want to go there, we, <laughs> we could make arrangements for that. But you don't want to be there. Paul says, I've given these guys over to Satan, and what it means is, is he has implemented a discipline to execute a, a, a judgment on them, not in a punitive sense, not in the sense that I'm going to beat you senseless until you get it right, but in a sense that I want you to wake up and come back to the reality. Folks, I'm here to tell you, Paul will implement church discipline on more than one occasion when people are obstinately refusing to obey God. And that's what he does here. Can I tell you, we run the risk of disfellowship when we refuse to obey Jesus. Unless the whole church is disobeying Jesus. And that's a danger. The reality is, is we're all here in the same place, claiming to surrender to the same Lord and to the same Savior, having heard his same mandate for each of us, it is incumbent upon this community of faith to say to everyone who comes under its influence, we follow Jesus. And we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through him. We follow Jesus, we believe Jesus, we obey Jesus. And if you want to be here and not follow Jesus, you don't want to be here. Is that okay to say? You bet it is. Because that's exactly what Paul said to Alexander and Hymenaeus. These two individuals didn't want to obey, and Paul says, okay, if you don't want to listen to Jesus as Savior and Lord, if you don't want to fight the good fight, if you don't want to hold on to the faith, if you don't want to live according with a good conscience and according to a clean bill of Scripture, if you don't want to live that way, fine, but do it somewhere else than here. There is nothing wrong with standing up and saying, Jesus is our standard and we're following Him. Follow with us as we follow Him. See, there's a risk when we say we don't want Jesus. And I believe we need to recognize that. And we must not, remember this is personal, we must not reject the mandate for ourselves. The challenge for the church today is just as real. And the challenge for those of us who are individual followers of Christ are just as real today. You see, I think that individually we need to decide that we're going to align ourselves with the mandate that Jesus gives. You know, this church would be just great if so-and-so would get their life right. I've heard that in churches before. If more people would just be more committed and more dedicated, then everything would be just fine. And folks, the problem with that mindset is, is everybody else needs to get right, but I'm just fine. I have a theological expression that I learned in seminary. I paid lots of money to learn this phrase, so I, I share it with you so that you can learn to pass this on. When people rise up and say, if they would only get themselves right, everything would be just fine, my theological response is this, hogwash. I paid lots of money to learn that word. That's just messed up. 
Because it's not about somebody else getting their life aligned with God and following the mandate of Jesus. It's about me aligning my life with the mandate of Jesus. And as a church, we say that's the challenge for every one of us. That the goal of this church is not to fix society. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. Society will never act like a Christian until it becomes Christian. Until the majority of our culture becomes Christian, it's never going to be Christian. It's never going to live according to godly values because they're not Christian. And instead of waiting for the society to get, get it right and start doing the right thing, you know what we need to do? We need to start getting it right and doing the right thing. And society will catch on. And we need to call ourselves and our church, our people, to say we're following Jesus. He's our master. He's our savior. He's our Lord. He calls the shots. I hope he calls the shots in your life. I hope and I pray that Jesus is your commander in chief. So that when he issues his command, your response will be, yes, sir. Let's pray together. Father, I believe you've called every single one of us as believers and followers of Christ to live yielded to him and obedient to him.